Today at six, the government sets out its plans in the King's speech with a promise to take the brakes off Britain. Amid all the pageantry of the state opening of Parliament, measures were announced to free up the planning process, to nationalise the railways and to improve the rights of renters and workers. Trumpets, fancy outfits and a hefty set of planned new laws, we'll try to explain what the new government is up to and what people make of it. Hello, good evening. King Charles has been setting out the new government's plans at the state opening of Parliament. 39 bills which Labour say will help to boost growth and take the brakes off Britain. Well, there'll be reform of the planning system to build new infrastructure and housing. The railways will be nationalised. More powers will be devolved in England to local leaders. Control of bus services, for example. The rights of both renters and workers will be improved and there'll be a new publicly owned clean power company called Great British Energy. Well, the King's speech was unveiled in Parliament on a day full of pomp, pageantry and traditions dating back centuries. And our political editor, Chris Mason, was watching. Chris. Yes, evening to you, Ben. I, I know how a day like today can feel for many people. It can feel otherworldly. And yet it offers us an insight into how we are governed, our unwritten constitution. There's the fancy bit up the road from here, Buckingham Palace and monarchy. And then there's the noisy bit here in Parliament. And today is a day where the two come together, where you have the fancy bit in the morning and the noisy bit in the afternoon. And also where you get a sense of consistency, that's the fancy bit, that's all of the stuff that we've been used to for centuries, and then change a very different House of Commons. Here is the story of the day. No space for passing traffic on a day whose rituals predate the motor car. A count them six horsepower carriage, the King on board. Much of all of this unchanged in years. Morning, Prime Minister. But he is a bit not seen in a while. These are the plans to be unveiled today of a Labour Prime Minister. This, then, their election promises, or at least some of them, today with horses, fancy dress and trumpets. A parliamentary official known as Black Rod, no matter how quickly she walks, gets the door to the Commons slammed in her face. Black Rod! To symbolise the independence of the House of Commons. And so to the speech, written by the government, read by the King. My government's legislative programme will be mission-led and based upon the principles of security, fairness and opportunity for all. Stability will be the cornerstone of my government's economic policy. A knowing smile from the new Chancellor being trusted to manage the economy and firing it up is key for Labour. And here's one big way they hope to do it. My ministers will get Britain building, including through planning reform, as they seek to accelerate the delivery of high quality infrastructure and housing. Next, transport and a plan to give local leaders more power over local buses in England and this on trains in England, Scotland and Wales. My ministers will bring forward legislation to improve the railways by reforming rail franchising, establishing Great British Railways and bringing train operators into public ownership. And what about dealing with crime and small boat crossings? My government will seek to strengthen the border and make streets safer. Big issues that were the old government's problem and now are for the new government to sort, or try to. Ministers also want to give people in England who rent their homes more rights and, eventually, eradicate smoking. And this is worth a glance, the civility of small talk between victors and the defeated. It looks like Rishi Sunak approves of the new Deputy Prime Minister's dress colour. Order to the debate then, and the Prime Minister. Sir Keir Starmer! Change is what this government of service will deliver. A King's speech, 
that takes the brakes off our economy and shows to the British people that politics can be a force for good, a rejection in this complicated and volatile world of those who can only offer the easy answer, the snake oil charm of populism. Yeah. And a new role for Mr Sunak, for now at least. On our side of the House, we will fulfil our duties as the loyal opposition, professionally and effectively. And across this House, we are all first and foremost patriots. We all wish to see our country and our people flourish and succeed. The Liberal Democrats said Labour faced massive challenges. They have a big job to do, and so do we. We will work hard on behalf of our constituents. We will scrutinise the government's plans carefully and strive to improve them. And, Mr Speaker, we will oppose them when we think they've got it wrong. And plenty here think the government's got it wrong by keeping the two-child benefit cap, which prevents most parents claiming for a third child. Surely it should be the bare minimum expectation of a Labour government to seek to do everything it possibly can immediately to lift children out of poverty. And Reform UK aren't impressed either. More taxes, more bureaucracy, more regulation. All this talk about energy, more renewable energy, will add to, add to costs, we'll have more expensive energy. This is a programme that will lead to lower growth and people will get poorer. The fanfare departing, the politics returning. The ceremony doesn't change much, but boy, the House of Commons has. Chris Mason, BBC News, Westminster. So, as we've heard, the new government says housing is a key priority. Well, a bill on renters' rights will include a ban on so-called no-fault evictions. There'll be reform of the leasehold system as well, tackling high ground rents. And the planning process will be streamlined to get more homes built. The government is aiming to create another one and a half million over the next five years. Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth has more details. In the village of Fradley, this land could see more than 100 new homes built. Developers say it will help meet Litchfield's housing need with homes for young people and support for green space and community facilities. But those living right next door disagree. Envisage over 250 extra cars up and down a cul-de-sac. In this cul-de-sac? In this cul-de-sac, yeah. Residents are concerned about the impact on the existing community. Well, the infrastructure cannot take any more houses. Um, there's uh, no GP services. To be honest, it does not need any more houses. It's overdeveloped. If somebody said to you, you're just being a NIMBY, you just don't want houses in your backyard. Not true. We need houses in this, in this country. We need affordable houses, but not to the, to the blight not to blight the people who live here already. Litchfield's seen a fair amount of development. Across England, the government wants to see more, saying people will have a say over how homes are built, but not if they are. Councils will have targets. But there is some concern about the control communities will have, not least in rural areas. The government says it will streamline the planning process to get more homes built. They say in the right places, with infrastructure, to keep communities on board. But the tension could come when they run into local objections. And the question is, what will Labour MPs, who now represent constituencies like Litchfield, do then? Litchfield's new MP was in Westminster today. When I talk to people across Litchfield, Burntwood and the villages, their major concern isn't just about what's being built, it's what's being built and the lack of infrastructure to support that. So I think as a government, when we're trying to push that through, making sure that the infrastructure comes alongside or ahead of housing, that's something that we should really champion and we should really celebrate. It's not just house building. Today, the government said it would introduce more rights for renters, protecting them from blameless evictions and take steps to end leasehold for new flats. At this coffee shop in Litchfield High Street, they're clear something must be done about the housing market. Kit's struggling to afford somewhere to rent, while Sam's renting, trying to save to buy. Looking at the rental properties that are available, I can't afford to move in and then still eat and pay the bills. I'd literally be able to afford the walls and that's it. How are you finding it out there in the market? It's, it's massively overpriced. Like, I mean, like... Some of the prices of certain houses, particularly I'd be looking for a three bedroom uh, for my two children, obviously, and my partner. I feel like this should be a lot lower. If I get my own place by the time I'm 30, that's great, that's incredible. It feels so distant and something that, you know, maybe just won't happen. <sighs> Fingers crossed. <laughs>
There's no easy fix. The government's plans may be ambitious, they will be complex and they could prove controversial. Alex Forsyth, BBC News. Well, throughout the election, we asked you what issues matter the most to you. Through your voice, your vote, you told us that the higher cost of living was a key concern. And today, the new government promised to prioritise what it called wealth creation for all communities. Our cost of living correspondent, Coletta Smith, has been taking a look through the details. We're a long way from the ceremony of Westminster. My government's legislative programme... But everyone cracking on with the job in hand knows that today's speech will impact their future. ..with employers at its heart. Joe and his girlfriend have been living with his parents for the last four years because they can't afford to save and rent. It's too much, way too much. I just can't afford it. I just can't. I mean, they've been announcing there today some better protections for tenants. Is yeah. that important? That is very important, very important, because if you're living in a house that has black mould in you, you're risking your health at the end of the day. Macaulay's hoping to be able to buy his own place soon too. More housing is good. I've seen that they're building on uh, these new green sites. They're uh, putting a lot more houses up in the uh, tops near in, in Bolton. In the town centre, there's frustration for many that the child benefit limit isn't going to be raised to cover more than two children. I've got three, mm -hmm. so I only get paid for two of them. OK. So, and it is hard work. It should go up, but they need to put a limit on how many kids. They do understand that the more children you have, they can't just keep it more and more and more yeah. money. It's not fair, is it? Phil and Dorothy rely on emergency credit for their gas and electric meters, even through these summer months. We only get £249 a fortnight. Mm. So, you know, if we're putting £8 a day in, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't leave us very fast. much. The government say Great British Energy will invest in green tech and energy bills will come down in the years ahead. It needs to be done now. Uh, it's not, you know, not in a few months, a few years. It needs to be done now. And enhance employment rates. Back at the factory, there's changes on the way for staff. To have someone, you know, appear through the door on day one and then end up with exactly the same rights as someone who's been here for 30 years. But it is very, very difficult to be a small business employing people on a fair basis. I won't even be able to get me a deposit for my house. With so many struggling to pay the big bills in life, today's speech doesn't feel like the immediate boost many had hoped for. Letter Smith, BBC News in Bolton. Well, on transport, the new government is planning to renationalise nearly all passenger rail services when existing contracts expire. And local councils and authorities will be offered the responsibility of running buses in their area. There are also plans to bring new rail infrastructure to northern England. With more on all of that, here's our transport correspondent, Katie Austin. Katie. Yes, Ben. The King's speech included laws which are set to usher in big changes to our transport networks. On the railway, the eye-catching nationalisation plan, which Labour had promised, is now going to be put in motion. Currently, a number of passenger rail services are already publicly run. But when private operators currently hold contracts, they'll be brought under public control as they expire over the coming years. Or, the government says, if they don't fulfil commitments. So don't expect it all to change overnight. A new arm's length body called Great British Railways will bring together the management of tracks and other infrastructure and trains. It'll probably take at least 18 months to set up, although there'll be a shadow structure in the meantime. It'll be tasked with improvements, including simplifying ticketing, Labour says its plans will save money and make things more joined up. Private operators warn costs could increase. There was also a law announced on buses, Britain's most used form of public transport. Services have been in long-term decline. New powers will allow local leaders in England to take control of services in their area through a process called franchising, recently introduced in Greater Manchester. And a ban on new publicly owned bus operators will be scrapped. The government thinks this will help local communities get the services they need, but it may not work everywhere. The government made it clear today it will not reverse Rishi Sunak's decision to cancel the second phase of HS2 to Manchester, but a parliamentary bill will be repurposed so other rail links in the north of England can be built. Ben. Katie, thank you very much indeed. Katie Austin there. 
Well, there were a host of measures announced in the King's speech today, including plans to make spiking somebody's drink with a drug a specific offence, a gradual ban on smoking and a bill to improve water quality, making water company bosses personally liable for breaking the law. There's to be a new border security command to crack down on people smuggling gangs and a measure called Martin's Law, named after one of the victims of the Manchester Arena bombing and aimed at improving security at public venues. Well, in a moment, uh, our political editor, Chris Mason, is going to be giving us his assessment of the King's speech. First, though, let's go to our economics editor, Faisal Islam, who's at the Treasury. And Faisal, wealth creation at the heart of the new government's promises. Is that easier said than done? Well, we heard that word growth in the King's speech multiple times, and every government says it wants growth. This government says it's its fundamental mission. So that creates quite a bar to judge this government in the coming years. How do they say they're going to get this growth? But if you like tweaking the plumbing and the wiring of the economic system to attract the private sector in to invest. The private sector that the government say may have been put off by economic instability after the mini budget, political instability in those post Brexit years, policy instability that they can get around now that they have a big landslide majority. And while you can see that they've made those sorts of trade offs, painful decisions on planning, for example, to attract investment in housing and infrastructure and in energy. Those trade-offs, well, will they stretch into other areas of policy? Some investors may want to investment in a factory that they can invest uh, and, and freely flow trade around Europe. Is that going to change? Some of those house builders may say, well, who's going to build those 300,000 homes a year? Will that change foreign worker policy? Other investors will wonder, are we going to get big public investment alongside this? So it's easy to say you're going to fix the economy it may not be a quick fix. OK, Faisal, thank you very much indeed. Faisal Islam there, our economics editor. And to Chris Mason, our political editor. Chris, 39 bills in this King's speech, but how ambitious do you think it was? There's no doubt it was pretty hefty in terms of that number, as you say, Ben. Here's the document the government uh, churned out alongside uh, the King's speech today. It's a fair old thing. The King's speech itself uh, ran to around 1,500 words, the longest in 20 years, one of the longest since the Second World War. The thing is, governing isn't only about legislating, and legislation, plan new laws, can get bogged down and amended and then overtaken by events. Events always happen and always knock a government off course. But it's worth emphasising, because the landscape politically has changed here substantially. Yes, this is a hefty set of plans, but the government has a hefty majority. So we, so we should expect the vast majority of these ideas, if the government remains committed to them, to reach the statute book to become law. But as Faisal was hinting at just there, firstly, there is that challenge around economic growth. And then secondly, there's the bigger picture challenge. Uh, you can campaign on that very powerful word change, and Labour did that and did that very successfully. Actually, delivering change is a whole other thing. All right, Chris, thank you very much. Chris Mason there, our political editor at Westminster. Well, the time is just uh, 19 minutes past six. Our top story this evening. <laughs>